everyone. Welcome to the June 25th edition of the Time Form US Forecast. I'm David Aragona, and this week we're continuing with that pattern of having some guests join me on these Time Form US podcasts. While my usual co host Craig is still recovering from surgery, I'm glad to see that Craig is getting back to posting some speed figures on Twitter and getting back into the swing of things. But I know that there's still a bit of recovery process to go. So I hope Craig continues to do well, and I look forward to having him back soon. But over these past few weeks, I have been enjoying the opportunity to get to talk to some fresh faces on this podcast. And that's the case today, as I'm pleased to welcome in a new guest on this podcast. I'm going to be joined by Optics EQ partner and analyst Emily Gullickson. I've been following Emily on Twitter for a little while now, and I like the way that she breaks down a race. And I know she's somebody with some strong opinions, so I'm looking forward to talking about some races with her. Uh, Emily, welcome to the podcast. I'm really, I'm a fan of yours as well. I've been following you for a while, and I was just really excited to have this opportunity to talk about races. We haven't really talked so much one-on-one, so I, I'm looking forward to this discussion, and these are some really challenging and good competitive races at Churchill Downs. Yeah, same here. And as Emily said, we are going to be talking about the late pick five at Churchill Downs on Saturday. This is their Stephen Foster card, and we'll be talking about that all stake sequence races eight through 12. The Stephen Foster is race 11, but the sequence does kick off with a couple of pretty confusing two year old races, the Debutante and the Bashford Manor. These always draw a lot of lightly raced horses without much experience. So replay watching and looking up uh, trainer patterns is really important in these races. And Emily, I don't know about you, but when I was looking at the these two races, it just struck me how much stronger the debutante appeared to come up than the Bashford Manor for the Colts. Yeah, I mean, I think they're both really competitive races, and I think they're tough, too, because you do, like you mentioned, you have these lightly raced horses, and they're all winners, right? They're all, they all have ones in their form, so that's not going to be the case on Sunday, so we have to kind of decide, you know, with these horses, where they are just in terms of their class and different terms of development moving forward, whether they're the graded stakes level or just even the stakes level for today, how they handle the added ground. So there's a lot of unknowns. And then, you know, for us, both you and I watch a lot of tape. You don't get a lot of trouble trips with these early races being at the shorter distance because a lot of these horses just show early speed. And that might not necessarily be their preferred running style as they develop. So it is interesting. I'm sure we'll spend time kind of going through horse by horse, but um, they're very interesting races. Yeah, and watching replays of these races in the past, both the debutante and the Bashford Manor, I mean, six furlongs can be kind of demanding for these two-year-olds in June of their juvenile season. And you often see these races go very quickly early and tend to slow down a great deal by the end of the races. So it's kind of a question also of stamina, who's going to get the right trip and who's going to be able to see out that demanding six furlong trip. So it's kind of hard to tell by watching some four and a half and five furlong races, which many of these are coming out of. But let's dive in and start with race eight, that debutante stakes for the two-year-olds old Phillies, as I said, going that three quarter of a mile distance. And we've got a couple runners from Steve Asperson here, who's always a powerful barn with the two year olds. The morning line favorite is actually one for Norm Cassie drawn to the outside on the ones and twos. And I think that's a good place to start because we've got two contenders coming out of the race that on the ones and twos one uh, that was a daughter of Jimmy Creed. And she was pretty impressive winning that race over Tiz Plenty, uh, who went out for the Steve Asperson barn. She was also making her debut in that race and was the one to two favorite. Obviously, Tis Plenty came out of that race to win, so that flatters the form of on the ones and twos. And also, that was a relatively fast race among the two-year-old races that we saw at Churchill this during the spring and summer meet. So these are definitely a couple of contenders in this race. Yeah, and I would say the one thing that kind of stands out with uh, on the ones and twos was just her size. I mean, if you're watching the replay, she's just kind of a big horse, you know, for, for these young two-year-olds. And that was just kind of the one thing that caught my eye. She just kind of towered over that group was a little late changing leads kind of got on track late and just you know again mentioning her physicality the extra ground should not be an issue for her and um uh, again uh, you mentioned it's a strong race next out winner with tez plenty so um i think that she fits as kind of the horse to beat off that race yeah, I noticed the same thing about her size. And also coming through the stretch, she didn't change leads until very late in the game. I think just the final five or 10 strides is when she finally moved over to her right lead. So the fact that she was able to come home as quickly as she did, and they were moving at the end of that race. They actually went pretty slowly for the first quarter and really picked it up through the stretch. So it was nice to see her show that acceleration even while she was racing on her wrong lead. And you do see that from the progeny of Jimmy Creed. They can be these big, imposing types right away when they're, they're generally pretty precocious. Uh, 
Uh, so she seems like a major contender in this race. And I get why she's the morning line favorite. She's arguably the one to beat. You do have those two Steve Asmussen runners. So I wanted to get your take on both of them. I mean, you've got Tiz Plenty who came out of that race and won. She was kind of a smaller, very typical of a Spites town uh, with that really compact build. And she does look like that out and out sprinting type. Wicked Halo, Asmussen's other runner, who's coming out of the maiden victory at Lone Star. Uh, she got a pretty big buyer speed figure for that race. Uh, she's one of uh, the progeny of Gunrunner, who's a freshman sire this year. Got a nice pedigree on the dam side. Her dam won the Adirondack. And she looked pretty good winning that race at Lone Star. And the runner up in there might be OK, too. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, mean, I do want to mention, too, because of the track conditions were muddy. And I, I don't know if you saw it the same way as I did, but um, that just kind of didn't seem quite a, a muddy track. It was a little bit more faster, at least visually. Um, and then kind of the same thing can be said for the track conditions for Behave Virginia once we get there. But I thought it was a really good effort for her. I mean, you do have to consider the class level because she was, you know, had the options to run at Churchill Downs, you know, obviously for, for Steve Asmussen in these bigger purse. And so to run it at Lone Star Park, granted she was training there. So it did make sense from that perspective. And since that race has been based at Churchill Downs, worked since that race. And I thought it was... Um, a really solid effort. I mean, she's on the inside, so she did have to show speed again with those shorter distance races, popped out of the gate and had a good gallop out. It was kind of a, a professional race for her. Um, did kind of have her ears back, but should have benefit from that race and on the rail. I thought it was a good effort, but again, it's going to be stepping up um, coming out of that circuit and here at Churchill Downs. Yeah, as I said, she got a big buyer speed figure for that race. I was looking at the time form US number. It was pretty much similar in 96. And I never know how much to make of the two-year-old speed figures because you've got some that are coming in much faster than others. And there can be a, a big variance sometimes between horses uh, when you're going just four and a half and five furlongs, given how quickly these races run and how much trouble can impact these horses within the race. So I try not to put too much into the speed figures and put more emphasis on what I see visually. I, I think you have to look at these races the same way and I agree about Wicked Halo it's it's a little weird that I started her at Lone Star just given the fact that she is that daughter of gun runner racing for the Winchells uh, the dam was a nice runner for this barn and uh, she didn't even take that much money on the race going off at five to two actually the exact same price as the runner up in there so a little weird I guess she wasn't touted in that race but she ran well so I mean she makes uh, she makes plenty of sense in here but there are definitely others to consider and I do want to touch upon a horse that you mentioned when we were talking about horses coming out of some wet track races and i agree with you those are definitely not sealed race tracks uh, it seemed like the wet fast track that behave virginia ran over and the muddy track that wicked halo ran over were both open harrowed tracks so i don't like to put too much stock in that but as for behave virginia the ken mcpeak trainee she kind of like uh on the ones and twos is coming out of a race that did not feature a particularly quick pace and she was up on it but she did show a pretty nice turn of foot through the lane yeah, I thought it was a really professional race from her. Looks to have upside off that effort and going forward. And again, she just handled the added ground, moves off the rail, which just in terms of her running style, talked about some of these horses before, how they just kind of show speed, just kind of based on those conditions first time out. Um, looks like one that could rate, you know, sit off horses and finish. So I, I think she's a, a contender in this race off that effort. Yeah, and she was on the lead the entire way, and I would imagine that she's going to get outrun to the front end here because it just seems like there are more naturally fast horses in the opening quarter mile in this race. But I did like that she was able to quicken in the stretch, and sometimes, even though horses don't show the ability to pass first time out, if they're able to produce that strong finish, even racing on the lead, that does give me some hope that they'll be able to pass horses when they have to come from off the pace. And also, I was just looking through some stats for these trainers, and Ken McPeak's statistics with these types of runners really stood out when I was looking up some uh, stats in DRF Formulator. Coming off debut wins in the second start, Ken McPeak is 7 for 18 over the past five years. It's a near 40% win rate with a 250 ROI. So uh, that uh, definitely makes Behave Virginia a candidate to repeat that effort or potentially improve in this race, and that definitely puts her in the mix. Uh, was there anybody else in here among the bigger prices that interested you a little bit? Because we just talked about mostly the horses that are going to be the favorites on the uh, in the wagering. Yeah, no, I, I think we I think we covered it. The other ones, I mean, the maiden claiming races and the Indiana Grand. I mean, I love the Indiana Grand. I follow that circuit, but I just can't get there. They're just a little bit too soft. So I think we touched on the uh, main players in here. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And those would be the ones that I would focus on in a multi-race sequence, maybe leaning a little bit on Behave Virginia and on, someone, on the ones and twos for all the reasons that we talked about. But uh, I would be surprised a little bit if the uh, winner came from outside of those four that we focused on. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on those two horses as well as being keys. Now, for me, the Bashford Manor, uh, which is a, a grade three event for the two-year-old males, looks far more competitive because you don't have runners with those standout speed figures like we saw on the debutante. And I don't think there's a whole lot of difference in ability from the morning line favorites to some of the long shots. And I, I imagine we'll get to them in a little bit. Um, it's hard to know exactly where the public is going to go in here. I, I would imagine that connections will play into it quite a bit. And that's why we're likely to see short prices on horses like double. Thunder for Todd Pletcher, as well as Red Run for Steve Asmussen. Red Run is a horse who was highly touted coming into his debut, going off at three to five. Personally, now, now this was a true wet track with that he ran over a sloppy sealed track, but personally watching that race, I wasn't thrilled with the effort. I guess he's got a right to improve second time out, but I think he's going to have to. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I went back and that, I was really just trying to do like an eye test on these horses. Because as you mentioned, there's really no like flashy standout or speed figure. So getting that eye test was kind of key. And I thought the same thing just in terms of red run. I, I like wanted to be excited about that effort and I really wasn't. But then I also just kind of looked at him overall and I'm like, this one just might be a horse that benefits from that race. Um, did have to show a little bit of class, you know, in order to get that win. As we talked about some of these horses, especially in the uh, in the debutante that typically win forwardly placed. So the fact that he had to pass horses shows a little bit of class and has come out of that race to work well. So that could just be a, a good spot for him landing in here, having that experience, being rested a little bit coming into this race. So I kind of landed there by default, but I'm not overly excited about him just because, you know, I do need to see, as you mentioned, has to improve and does need to show more. Yeah, it's kind of funny watching these progeny of Gunrunner because he does, I mean, we've only seen a few of them so far, but he does seem to really stamp the foals that we have seen with that really low head carriage like he had. And you saw that from Red Run, who actually looks a lot like his sire, also being a chestnut. Um, I guess I was just hoping for him to draw off a little bit more decisively at the end of that race because he ranged up coming to the top of the stretch like he was going to really pull away impressively and he just never quite did it. But it was just his first start and he does have a right to improve. Um, I should note that he's got a big pedigree on the dam side his dam is a full sister to untappable who was a star for these connections obviously winning the kentucky oaks the breeders cup distaff many other major races so you would imagine more distance is going to suit this one and he gets that here so he's definitely one to consider uh, the other horse that i mentioned that could take some money is the number eight double thunder for todd pletcher a horse coming out of a race at monmouth where he actually did not take nearly as much money as his stable mate another todd pletcher trainee but he was able to run that one down and I actually liked the debut of this one a little bit more than Red Run uh, because he actually finished with some vigor and that was not a particularly quick pace. So I liked the way that he came home. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, but I, again, it's it's one of those where just placement in terms of running at Monmouth um, condition wise, stable mate was favored in there and was ridden pretty hard. So um, I think landing in this spot is a positive getting John Velasquez is a positive um, and could see some improvement. Um, and again, I don't, I didn't dislike that race. So um, certainly fits in this race. Yeah, it's a little weird to see Todd Pletcher even have a starter in this race because he usually focuses way more on the New York Stakes race. He's not afraid to run multiple horses in there for the two-year-olds. Uh, it's just, I, I haven't noticed him running a lot of horses in the Bashford Manor over the past several years, but I guess he has a precocious one. And it's not the toughest field, so I don't, right. uh, I get why some horses are, or why some connections are taking a shot here. Um where else do you want to go next? I mean, there are a lot of horses we could talk about, uh, and I think there are some price horses that are a little interesting. So who, who did you find uh, that might be uh, worth a shot at a price? Well, if, you know, if we're talking like price horses in here, I'd probably have to go to uh, the number three tapped off, um, even though he's still a maiden. That was a really strong effort. And I think just in terms of strength of the field, I think that's going to be a pretty good maiden race, that June 4th race at Churchill Downs. And I mean, just visually watching watching his race, I mean, he moved up early. He was part of that early pace. The race was slowing late. Um I believe the fourth place finisher of that race just won at Indiana Grand. Um I, 
this week. So there's a little bit of form there. And again, I just think the strength of that race, there were some pretty good horses in that field. So coming out of that race um, gives him a look. Obviously, this is a, a, a big step up in class. He's still a maiden. Um, but there, there was really nothing to knock from that run um, from him. What did you think of that effort? Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good effort. He what what I noticed about him was that he traveled really nicely into the race and he just kind of got swallowed up by the end when the whole field came together. But I liked the way that he was in the bridle throughout and it looked briefly like he was going to draw from that field. But as you said, there might have been some quality runners in there. So, I mean, he did just uh, he wasn't quite able to get it done. But as one of the few horses in this race who has not yet won, uh, he likely is not going to take that much money in here. So I do think he's one to consider because his speed figure is basically basically right in line with everybody else. And uh, there are a couple other horses that I want to talk about that also likely are going to be prices in this race. One of those is coming out of Indiana Grand, so I want to get your take on them. Actually, both of the horses I'm going to talk about are coming out of Indiana Grand. Um, the, I'll start with what's the connection for John Ennis, which I know is a barn that can get these two-year-olds ready to win on debut. Uh, but uh, this horse had a lot of gate speed. He made the front pretty easily. And the runner-up in that race, Moens, who was a big price, uh, he ran a nice race that day, but he took a big step forward next time when he won, I think by over six lengths and really improved his speed figure. So I wonder if maybe that's a stronger race than it initially seems. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a it's a big class test coming out of there. It does have to improve. There was minimal change in running order that day. Um, Ennis can often, you know, come in pretty live, even if the, the money's not there. Um, so it just does have to improve quite a bit just in terms of speed figures and circuit. A uh, big step of it up in class um, for him. As far as Mullins, um, it was a good effort for his his second start. Again, did improve. Um, Optics has it as a, a 74, uh, 65 on debut, and then a 74 breaking his maiden to Indiana Grand earlier this month. Um, so 74 is still just kind of a little bit below. Um, so again, just kind of does have to improve, but you should be getting a price just kind of based on those connections coming into this race. And the other horse I wanted to get your take on, who arguably is a little more ridiculous, is the number 10 Rising Outlaw, who I know is coming out of the maiden claiming race, and that typically is not a sign of confidence. Uh, but this trainer, James Chapman, is one that just rarely wins on debut. His horses often need a start. He has much better statistics with his second time starters. So I think that there is a pattern with this barn that you're likely to see a move forward from Rising Outlaw. And I don't know. I, I, that probably was not the strongest race, but I liked the way that he did it. He was actually kind of green in the running. He was shifting ground a little bit in the stretch, but he finished up nicely. As a son of Bodie Meister, he's not likely to have trouble with the added distance, and his speed figure is a little bit off some of the others in this race, but as I said, it's not like the favorites are running so fast that I'm afraid to take a shot against them, so he was one that I wanted to get in there at a price. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that you said, just in terms of assessing like the performance itself. And then just from a visual standpoint, should continue to handle the added ground. He was scratched and entered in the Tremont stake. So there could be some positive intent just in terms of running in this spot. Again, it will be a big class test coming out of that maiden claiming race. And then it just even going further, I mean, he was set to debut here at Churchill Downs for 50. So um, looks like there's, there's some upside, could be figuring it out. Agree with him being green on debut just again um class is just such a big test uh maiden claiming to graded stakes yeah is there anybody else you wanted to mention in this race we didn't even touch upon some short prices like lands uh lands down and glacial um personally i wasn't thrilled with their debut efforts but i mean obviously they're contenders in this race yeah, no, I'm glad. I think we should just touch on real quick. I mean, Lansdowne, it's like, I want to just kind of love him because I, I like the first, you know, maybe six furlongs of that, or first uh, half mile, I should say, of that race. And they just kind of like didn't change leads and looked a little bit cranky. So um, he has worked forwardly out of that race, so certainly could could move forward in here. And then Glacial, I, I sort of agree. I mean, it was just hard set, broke slow, um, which is kind of typical for Talamo. It's not the best gate rider. So broke slow and then was kind of used for the lead. Does have to improve a little bit, but, um, you know, I agree. I'd probably prefer Lansdowne a little bit more, especially if he's kind of figured it out um, from the debut to take a step forward of that pair. 
Yeah, we saw a lot of the same things. I think Lansdowne just needs to gain a little bit more stamina. But I mean, the other slight negative with him is that he's probably going to be under the gun from the rail again because he's drawn inside. There's so much speed in this race. You imagine they're going to be moving up front. So he's going to really have to be able to get the six furlongs to be successful here. And I guess what I'm kind of getting at with giving a push to some long shots in this race is that I don't anticipate we're going to see the two-year-old champion coming out of this Bashford Manor. So I'm not going to be surprised if this race comes back with a pretty uninspiring speed figure. So I think it could be one that's open to some long shots. Yeah, no, I, I don't I don't disagree with that assessment at all. Let's move on to some races for the older horses and we'll move on to the turf for the middle leg of this pick five sequence in race 10. It is the grade two wise Dan going a mile and a 16th on that Churchill turf course. And set piece is a horse that I think you have to come into this race with an opinion about to be able to play it because based on his last effort, uh, he looks like he could be a graded stakes horse. The problem with set piece is he's put up these big efforts before and hasn't always backed them up against tougher company. And looking back, Back at that uh, overnight stakes that he won back in late May, while he was visually impressive, there was some pace going on up front. I thought that the runner-up Ramsey solution did not get the best ride in the world from Leperu and arguably should have been closer to him at the end. And I think set piece is coming into this race a little bit with that so-called dressed up form, but he definitely does have some talent. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think he does have some dressed up form and class is a big test. I mean, for these connections um, and the fact that they just haven't been putting him in graded stakes races says a lot. Uh, and that kind of answers the question without being the question being asked. So they've been running in those overnight stakes for a reason, stepping up to this graded stakes company. It's, it's a, it is a big ask for him. He's in good form. He has those figures, but as the favorite, um, I'm willing to play against him uh, in this spot, like without a problem. <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same way. He feels like one of the favorites on this card that you might be able to beat because, frankly, his main rival, some like it hot brown, just seems like he's got a lot going for him in this race. There's not that much pace signed on. He's a horse who's always dangerous when he's able to get a clear lead in the early going. And I think he proved last time out at Pimlico that he's still in reasonably strong form. I know there are some questions about it after he ran so poorly in the Fort Lauderdale and the Maker's Mark, though. I was always somebody who said that you know, he didn't run that poorly in those races because he was just facing impossible pace situations in those two spots. They just went too quickly up front for him. But uh, when he gets the right kind of pace scenario, he's always dangerous in these races. Yeah, I mean, he's he's another horse that just in terms of class could just be a little bit soft. I mean, the dinner party stakes did not come back a strong race. The horses out of that, that event have not run well. Um, and then considering the placement that they've been in, um, not super strong races, overnight stakes, um, events. I think the only horse by by Melvin, he ran the Manhattan um didn't really run that well in that race. So I think there's some class questions with him. Another horse that at a short price, I don't have a problem taking on. You make the point in terms of a pace and he could have a little bit of a pace advantage, but his stable mate who has a little bit more class and has enough speed to keep up with him. And I prefer him more. That's the number eight field pass. Um, I can excuse the man of war that being an 11 furlong race, probably not his ideal distance. And again, I just, I, he has enough tactical speed that he can, keep pace with his stable mate um and again has a better class a little bit more positives in terms of his form cycle coming into this race as well yeah, I've got no problem with field pass. I think he's one of the ones who's interesting in this race. And I do kind of want to get your take on the maker's mark that both he and Ride a Comet come out of. I know that was a race that got a lot of people really jazzed about Raging Bull because it came back a, a very fast event for a grade one. And it looked like maybe Raging Bull could turn into a horse that might be able to win the Breeders' Cup mile for the U.S. Though that maker's mark, it's, it's kind of turned into a race where the horses that were on the pace came out of it to run really well. Those that were closing into that fast pace have come back and disappoint a little bit and uh, to be fair field pass was one of the ones who was relatively close to the pace chasing those leaders in fourth ride a comet though uh he got the perfect run into the race from far back and just couldn't quite get to raging bull and i i wonder first of all how far this horse really wants to go maybe a mile in the 16th is okay for him but i also think he's gotten some pretty good trips when he's been successful and i preferred field pass out of that race like you 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm not against Ryder right Comet at all. Um, I think that, you know, you mentioned the distance, which he's not really a nine furlong. And he has won at nine furlongs back, what was that, a juvenile season. Um, so he can do it when he's in the right spot. But I think the right spot for him is key because he's not quite a grade one type horse. So that gives him, he was that flow upgrade, as you mentioned, the maker's Mark Mile, but was a little bit exposed in the Kilro Mile. Um, granted, he was widened against the flow, so he had upside off that trip. But this being a grade two, and it is just kind of a, you know, a softer grade two. We mentioned set piece as the favorite in here, who really doesn't have any graded stakes form um, to his credit. This is just a better spot class and distance wise for Ride a Comet. Um, with this race, and I, I think he's been kind of pointed in here, has been freshened. Um, Gaff Leone has been aboard in the past, doesn't have to be as far back in his races, has a little bit more tactical speed when he wants to use it to kind of put himself into a position and get a trip, which will be key in here. As you mentioned, there isn't a whole lot of speed, so um, the rider tactics is going to be key, and I, I think Ryder right, right Comet could get the right trip, and it's in the right spot, just class, surface, and distance. Is he the one you're kind of leaning towards? Is there anybody else among the double digit odds horses that you consider? Uh, there's one that I find a little bit interesting, but I'm wondering if there's anybody you like. You know, yeah, I mean, I went through this race quite a bit. And I mean, I, I lean on class a little bit more than maybe most, especially in a race like this. So for me, ride a common and field pass kind of stand out. And I, I you know, again, again, I'm playing against those two short price horses. So I want to make sure I covered all my bases and went back in and watched some of these longer price horses. And I just couldn't quite get there. They just don't quite look, look to the level. I am curious to, to who you're giving a, a shot to, um, because I couldn't really see any as contenders necessarily. Yeah, maybe I'm trying to make him better than he is, but uh, I think Spooky Channel could run okay in here. Maybe not win the race, but he's going to be a big price. So he's the kind of horse that I will use in a multi-race sequence and also kind of uh, underneath a little bit in some exotics. Uh, but uh, he's had excuses in his last couple of starts. I mean, two back that optional claiming race. That was one that Strong Tide just dominated on the front end. The pace was not particularly quick. And uh, he came running late. And then last time I just thought, his rider never really got him into position to make a run in that Louisville. He got steadied pretty significantly coming to the quarter pole there, really lost momentum at a critical time in the race. And even coming to the stretch, he could just never really get into the clear. I'm not saying that he was going to beat Arklo or even finish in the exacta in that race, but it was just not nearly as poor a performance as the final result would make it seem. And going back through his form, he does have a few races scattered in there that make him competitive here. And he's also a horse that they focus focused on running long distances, you know, those mile and three eighths, mile and a half distances quite a bit. And I'm not convinced that that's really his best trip. I think he's run some pretty nice speed figures and some good efforts against solid company going short or even as short as a mile and the 16th, the distance of this race. So I think Spooky Channel is the, the one long shot that I could make a real push for in this race. And for him and how much I want to use him, it just kind of depends on the price. Yeah, I mean, I, I you, you know, you make good points, and obviously the traffic trouble last time out compromised him in terms of better position, but I'm kind of negative on him for those reasons that they have been running in those longer distance races, because that's usually not the most positive sign when they cut back in distance. They're usually running in those longer races. Um because they're just not quite on the level of like the mile or even the the nine for a long type horses. And he's been a little bit exposed when he is running in those shorter races at the graded stakes level. So I can, you know, I can understand why people would want to get there and he has some quality to him. I liked him. Uh, well, I was really high on strong tide, but I liked him coming out of the, um, the fairgrounds race. I thought he had upside off that with a wide trip, not really with the track profile, but again, I just, you know, just couldn't get quite get there in terms of class, but I, I think he's a quality horse. You bring up really good points on him. Um, I'm just, you know, leaning for those other two in terms of a top spot. Yeah, it's just the horse that has those minor excuses piling up, and maybe it doesn't all add up to him winning this race, but I think he could outrun his odds. So, I mean, to be clear, I'm not saying I'm necessarily making him my top pick. I kind of would lean towards those two maker runners that we touched upon and kind of reluctantly giving the, the uh, preference to some like at Hop Round, even though he has a shorter price. But Spooky Channel is the kind of horse I would try to get in there. Let's move on to the Stephen Foster, and I think we could probably spend the least time on this race. Well, assuming you agree with me, I... 
I tried to make a case against Maxfield personally. I've just never been the biggest fan of this horse. Uh, I don't think he's necessarily going to pan out to be among the best handicap horses in this division by the time the year is through, but does feel like he's found a pretty soft grade two in the Stephen Foster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, both you and I approach it the same way. And I think every handicapper has to start there is you have to try to pick apart Max Field and see if you could beat him. And pretty much my only kind of knock with him in this group is the distance, but it just kind of feels like his class and his current form are just going to be able to overcome that. It's not like this is that long of a race, the 10 furlongs, if it was that, maybe you could start to, to pick apart. But I agree. I mean, it just seems like Maxfield has the speed figures, the class, the running style that all fits at this level. And if you are trying to beat him, every other horse in this field looks exactly the same. So I don't know how you could try to even separate those horses that are that are right below him, because I certainly tried um, and I couldn't get there. So I think Maxfield is is pretty legit in this spot. It's kind of his race. Yeah, I totally agree. And the other thing about it is it's the kind of race that does figure to play to Maxfield's strengths, because I think his one area of weakness is that he doesn't have, you know, the the best stamina for those mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter distances. But what he does have is a really nice turn of foot. And given that there's not much speed signed on really outside of Warrior's Charge, who figures to control things up front, maybe with some token pressure from Sprawl, it does feel like another one of these route races on the dirt at Churchill that's going to go pretty moderate fractions up front and turn into a sprint around the three eighths with about three eighths to go. And that just really is the kind of trip that Maxfield wants, where he can break the race open around the far turn and just kind of boss this field around when they get to the stretch with that uh, fast final quarter mile that he has. So it's just hard for me to go against him. He's going to be a short price, not the right kind of race that I'm really interested in playing solo, but it does make it a little bit easier to spread in some other races from a pick five standpoint. And I mean, is there anybody else that you want to back up with? I mean, I tried to make a case for Warrior's Charge, but again, he's just not the kind of horse that I've ever been a big fan of, and he's another one that kind of needs everything to go his way. Yeah, um, I think there's, you know, there's a few that are probably worth, because I think you and I probably went through this process the same way that we really tried to find somebody. Um, You know, Nectar Island for me was kind of that horse just because he seems like he's on the improve, but I'm not sold on him as far as distance. He really does look like his preference is that one turn, but I do like his progression and the way that he's moving forward into this race. It's probably worth mentioning the blame stakes with Sprawl and um, South Bend coming out of that race. I mean, Sprawl, I think, could get a lot of attention because he kind of has that look like of a horse that is developing and has been running some fast races. But in my opinion, it didn't really seem like he had much of an excuse um, to not win that day and was just kind of one pace when he needed to kick. And then you could make a little bit of an excuse for South Bend because he was in traffic or he was kind of late changing leads to kind of split horses. So maybe he has a little bit of upside off that trip. I would kind of give him the lean of that pair. Um, But just kind of overall watching the visuals of those horses, I just couldn't get, could not get excited about either of them um, up against Maxfield. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I mean, if I was going to play exotics and try to get horses in second or third here, those would definitely be two that I'd consider. Uh, Sp- Sprawl, I mean, I my, my note on him that I is kind of knocking him down in my estimation is that that race that he won so impressively too back over that sloppy sealed track, I... I viewed that rail as being a bit of an advantage, like a gold rail situation, not the strongest one that we've seen, but it did seem like it was a little bit of a conveyor belt that day. And I think that exaggerated his performance a little bit. And when you take out that, his surrounding form just isn't that inspiring. Um, But uh, I mean, he's got the right running style. So he's one that could be competitive in here. I mean, the one other horse that I was trying to make a little bit at a huge price is Empty Tomb, who has just kind of steadily been improving on the dirt. And uh, he's got to get the mile an eighth here, which is a bit of a question, but he's another one that has the right running style. He should be forwardly placed. Again, I don't think he's a win candidate, but at a price, I mean, he's not going to be a shock to me if he rounds out the trifecta. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think that that's probably the best advantage that he has is being inside, having Santana aboard and having that early speed. Um, And again, I mean, we've seen this track that maybe it is one of those days where you want to be inside and speed and that upgrades horses. And then uh, empty tomb would certainly like fit that pattern. 
Now, things once again get pretty difficult as we move on to the final leg of this sequence, the tep-in for the three-year-old Phillies going one mile on the turf course. Uh, it's hard to even know really where to start in this race because it's so competitive. Um, I guess you've got those two horses that are coming out of the Soaring Softly at Belmont, which was a one-turn seven furlong race. And the big favorite in there was Toby's Heart, who I think the jury is kind of still out about how much stamina she possesses and how far she wants to go. She did not get a great trip in the Soaring Softly when she was just never clear through the stretch and really Manny Franco just couldn't get her in a position to launch that late kick that she possesses but still I don't know that I love her stretching back out to the two turns and also Invincible Gal who was second in that race she was kind of wide throughout but she just followed the winner into the race I thought that she ran fine but she's another one that I kind of prefer going a little bit shorter she can get the mile but I don't know if she's best at it so they both make sense but this is a race where I think that you can make a case for a lot of other bigger prices. Yeah, and I mean, I actually kind of like a horse in here quite a bit. Um, the number three Fairchild, and I'm following her. I do the notes for optics at Fairgrounds. So following her from the debut, that was just a, an awesome debut, better than look. She broke slow. She had traffic. She closed. It was a massive gallop out. And then had a better than looked effort in a super strong event, making her second start on March 4th. And then she did what needed to be done at Keeneland, breaking her maiden. But she has that foundation, has that improvement. And then she was coming back off a little bit of a layoff and maybe just given that race but still good effort as it was on the main track it was one turn she was wide and if any barn is pointing to a stakes called the Teppin, I mean I'm not saying but I might be saying you know Mark Cassidy kind of seems like this is the right spot I mean this belly has some quality to her and I think she's just probably flying under the radar with those races being at the maiden level and then coming off that main track race she's going to get back on the turf this is where she belongs again has the foundation um, around two turns on the turf um and I, I, you know, I just, I think that she has some quality to her and this is kind of the right spot for her. And again, at a price, um, her numbers kind of stack up with some of these others. Um, I, I like her in this spot. Yeah, I love that. I mean, she's going to be a big price in this race. I don't know if she'll be the 20 to one that she has on the morning line, but she's going to be double digits in this spot. Uh, so uh, I, I like those notes on her and she's definitely one that could improve because I'm not thinking that the horses with stakes experience are necessarily so formidable in this race. And I do want to discuss a few of these horses coming out of maiden wins. A fair child is one. And I even think Mark Cassie's other runner who I actually gave preference to on the outside commander's palace also makes some sense in this race. I mean, I liked her effort too back at Keeneland when she was closing into a slow pace behind Navision sunrise, who looks like she could be a decent filly for Chad Brown. She came back and was an okay second in allowance race next time. And she'll actually run at Belmont on, on Sunday in the, uh, or I should say Saturday in the wild applause, but Commander's Palace came back in her next start at Churchill and she got a pretty wide post. I think she was drawn 11 of 12. Uh, so she had to be used a little bit in the early going to get over and the pace did moderate on the back stretch, but it never looked like she was losing that race. She really finished well and just didn't really let anybody get close to her, even though she only won by half a length. Uh, she held those runners at bay pretty gamely. And uh, this is another spot where I think um, it kind of is a murky pace situation. I don't know how quickly they're going to go up front. So I like that she's got that versatility where Florent can either have her close to the pace or coming from off it. Yeah, yo, know, I agree. I mean, you have uh, a lightly race developing type that has some foundation under her um, and those and those connections as well. Yeah, a couple other horses I want to mention. Um, I, I I was getting a little bit drawn into Town Avenger, who's coming out of that sprint victory on debut. These are the kind of horses that I typically like to stay away from because you never know how this turf sprint form is going to translate to a, a true route race like this Teppin. Uh, but she was visually impressive that day, going wide on the turn, always traveling well and, and seeing it through, even though the pace was relatively slow. She's got a big pedigree on the damn side to go much longer than five and a half, which I guess makes it a little weird that they started her off in a turf sprint, even though she is a daughter of Spitestown. Um, she might have to take a step forward, but I do think there's some talent there. It just remains to be seen if this is the right spot. Yeah, I agree with I agree with all those points. The right spot and then price as well um, just seems a little bit short as you have those hurdles taking on winners, new distance, um, you know, a lot of challenges that you do have to weigh in the price. Yeah, and the one other horse I want to mention before we we wrap things up uh, is Navratilova, who, again, is one of the, these horses that's coming out of sprint races, but I wonder if she's not a true sprinter because her damn center court was raced by these connections. Uh, she was a true mile to mile on an eighth kind of horse. And the one time that they tried her going long, she was chasing the pace set by Aunt Pearl and the Jessamine. And that was a race where I, I think 
chasing Ann Pearl was not the ideal situation to be in. And she kind of faded at the end, but I don't think she was totally disgraced in that spot. And since then, she's come back with a couple of improved effort as a, efforts as a three-year-old, albeit sprinting. But if you watch that race last time at Churchill, the stakes, I mean, she was so wide around the far turn. I mean, I, I don't want to be too hard on Julian Laparu because it just seemed like she never, he never had a chance to get her inside, but she was legitimately five or six wide all the way around the turn. So she lost a lot of ground in there. Again, I'm not sure about the quality of that race overall, but she does have to stretch out. But I just think she's a horse that that might have more of a propensity to go longer than her PPs might make it seem like. Yeah, um, I, I, it's kind of one of those where I just kind of have to see it, and I haven't quite seen it yet from her visually. I'm not so much like a big pedigree player, especially when horses have foundation and have races. So from her, she just kind of still has to prove it. And then just in terms of trip, um, there does look to be some pace, like you mentioned, it is a little bit muddy because you have horses that are lightly raced and making that um, distance change in here. But does seem like regardless, she's going to want to be forwardly placed. Um, in this field. So we'll have to overcome the distance as well as trip with some other pace pressure. Yeah, we touched on a bunch of horses. Is there anybody else that you wanted to mention? Because I do kind of view this as a spread race to end things. I know that you have a strong opinion on a long shot, but I mean, is there anybody else you'd want to use or are you just kind of playing against the favorites in this one? Um, no, you know, I mean, I think Invincible Gal, I think that those favorites are legit that you mentioned to kind of start off. I am going to key off uh, Fairchild. I don't, and it's not necessarily because the morning line, I think the morning line is, is a little bit ridiculous. If she is that, I mean, I, I it'll be welcome, but I, I would probably think maybe half. Um, but it is a competitive field. Maybe people will be confused, not sure where to go. I think the other horse just kind of worth mentioning because people just might be confused on what to do with her is the number seven adventuring. Like what your thoughts on her that now she's she's going to get to the turf and uh, make some changes coming out of the Black Eyed Susan. Yeah, I'm not one of these people that thinks that synthetic form just automatically translates to turf. And I guess if you do think that, then she's a major player in here because her bourbonette was OK. Um, and and last time out in the Black Eyed Susan, that's just not a race I really want to hold against anybody. That was kind of a weird racing surface. And and but but she does have enough turf pedigree on the damn side. If you are looking at pedigree, she's a half to romantic pursuit who could go longer distances on the turf. So, I mean, that she does make some sense from that standpoint, but I'm never one to kind of gravitate too much towards horses that are switching surfaces with competitive speed figures on another surface because they're going to take a lot of money and they still have that surface question to answer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I kind of, I, I, I wanted to mention her just because I think she's that one horse that people will probably discuss or be, you know, kind of not sure what to do with. But, but I'm kind of with you that um, I, I'm just not sold on her in this spot. Kind of seems maybe a little bit more experimental at this point. Before we close things out, I just want to kind of pick your brain a little bit. I don't know if you're much of a, a pick five or multi-race sequence player, if you like to play intra race more, um, but from a pick five standpoint, kind of what would your, be your strategy to go about playing this one? Um, yeah, so I kind of have to go back through. I don't want to necessarily give out horses, but kind of more of like how I'm looking at each race as a whole and how I would approach it. Yeah. Um, I think that there's some horses that are worth kind of keying on. I mean, I mentioned that as much to kind of close out, like keying on a price. Um, and then a couple of these other horses. So I'd probably be a, a little bit more like keying off a horse to start um, race eight. And then also kind of backing up with maybe a few others. There's no real race to me that looks like an all. Um, the ninth race is probably a little bit more of a spread, as you mentioned, because there's just no clear cut standout and not many of those horses would surprise. I wouldn't necessarily go all in there, but I think it's probably one you could get a little bit deep on. Um, in that race, as far as going into the 10th, um, I would be playing against set piece um, and some like at hot brown. That would just be my strategy in there. I could see short prices in some some of those other spots. So this race could be a separator and I'm just kind of leaning more on the class um, of write a comment field pass in that race. Um, going into the 11th, again, if we're talking short prices, I mean, Maxfield. Um, again, like if you don't single max field, then maybe you do have to go all because I don't know how you separate the rest of the field. So probably more of a, of an anchor type horse, um, even though he's a short price and then keying off, um, the price horse in that last 
race with Fairchild and then could use some others, um, just kind of depending on how I saw the sequence. I wouldn't want to use a lot of short prices in there if I thought it was going to be like max field and short prices all the way, um, that type of strategy. But I don't know if that answered your question, but that's sort of how I would approach it. I'm sort of one of those players that like, if I'm going to play the pick five, I want to have an opinion to like make a cash, not just play the sequence to like cash a ticket, if that makes sense. So I would approach it in a way that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get, get a positive score out of the sequence. No, that, that's great information because we do sometimes get questions from listeners about ticket construction. So I think it's always worthwhile talking about it a little bit. And we have a pretty similar view of this one. I mean, I'm reluctant to single horses, but Max Field does feel like the kind of horse that you would lean on pretty heavily. And I agree, set piece is the horse that I'd want to fade in that middle leg. And for me, the ninth and the twelfth would be the two spread legs, trying to get some of those prices in there and actually emphasizing those prices a little bit. So uh, that, that, that was great. Uh, Emily, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Hopefully we gave out some good opinions. And uh, uh, if you uh, stay tuned for the Time Form US podcast next week, uh, when I do the Pace cast, I will actually be having the voice of Churchill Downs on Travis Stone to join me. So look forward to that as we will recap all of these races. Emily, before I let you go, just uh, tell some of the listeners where they can find your stuff and, and your analysis. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you again for having me on. This was fun. Um, Optics EQ will have um, all all the information, plot notes, all that good stuff. And then my analysis can be found at Brisnet, Daily Selections for Southern California, Indiana Grand. And then um, on the Woodbine site, Daily Plays at woodbine.com. You can follow that hashtag that Woodbine TV. Awesome. Everybody remember that you can always listen to these DRF podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Again, big thanks to Emily for joining me today, and make sure to stay tuned for that Time Form US Pacecast next Tuesday.